أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم محمد الأمين وعلى أهل بيت الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين آمين يا رب العالمين Dear respected viewers, thank you for joining us once more live here from the holy city of Karbala in which we are returning back to our discussion. Of course, this is your show, Back to the Basics, live from the Imam Hussein television network, in which we will be continuing to discuss our basic general thesis, that there is an appropriate method by which we can engage with others appropriately in discussion, which is both respectful to the akhlaq, to the ethical disposition of our school of thought, but also quite respectful of the individuals that we'll be speaking to. But nonetheless, it's constructive and wastes neither our time nor theirs. Over the past few weeks, we have been discussing a general layout of what a worldview is, what a worldview looks like, and the big questions that a worldview would concern itself with. We thereafter moved on to look at some practical examples of how we would apply this framework. And the first question we asked was about the value of intellect. But in order that we did not enter into such deep water, which would have been quite difficult for the viewer to cope with without understanding practically where this series might be heading, we took a brief pause and we applied these steps practically to the Salafi school of Islamic theology, where we found that the school was certainly lacking in its ability to offer us any intellectual growth or indeed any good reason to trust the human intellect. There afterwards, we moved on to the real beginning of the discussion, namely, where any worldview discussion should begin. The question of whether or not a God exists. And of course, we looked at the atheist worldview. Of course, for those who might be confused, they can refer back to previous episodes where they would see that why I keep referring to atheism as a worldview as a in, in distinct contradiction to those who maintain that it's merely the absence of a belief in a deity. And I have stated that atheism is not merely the absence of belief in a deity, rather to exclude the belief in a deity in your worldview has massive consequences and we've seen some of those consequences thus far. We've been looking at the words and the works of one particular atheist scholar, his name is Professor Alex Rosenberg, in his book The Atheist Guide to Reality, in which he unpacks what he believes reality is. And just to give ourselves a brief reminder before we enter into the new discussion of tonight. Alex Rosenberg proposes that essentially the only way we can understand reality, which he believes has been firmly vindicated by the findings of modern science, are to understand the world, the universe, ourselves, and indeed every phenomenon which exists within the realm of human knowledge and experience through the lens of the science of physics. He states that the only facts about anything are the physical facts, or to quote his own words, the physical facts fix all the facts. And so he argues quite succinctly that if there is no God, and the only realm which we can observe, which can even be contemplated, understood, or experienced is the physical world, then the only reality that exists are physical realities. The realities known in physics as being made up of atoms and bosons and fermons. And the only explanation we can have of anything is a physical explanation. He is a physicalist, a materialist, and as a consequence of that, he's quite willing to embrace everything within the distinct framework that that offers. That is to say, Rosenberg openly admits, for those of you who wish to see this, they can refer back to the episodes we were going through before the Christmas special. Rosenberg openly admits that if one is to embrace 
the ideology that he proposes, which he argues is backed by empirical evidence, we would observe, number one, that physical facts are the only facts that exist. Number two, we would understand that human beings do not have such a concept known as morality and that there are no moral facts because moral facts are not physical facts and nothing which is not a physical fact is a fact indeed. But more important even that, Rosenberg took us one step further than all of that. Not only did Rosenberg argue that we should be morally nihilistic, and nihilism, by the way, is that theory that we can dictate our own morality. We do as we see fit. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world, and therefore I shape my own morality. I would decide what's right for me. I would decide what's wrong for me. This is the worldview as proposed by Rosenberg when it comes to the, the field of human ethics and morality. But when it comes to more than just ethics and morality, Rosenberg has an even more disastrous thought, which, of course, we believe is the very crux and the very Achilles heel of the atheist worldview. Rosenberg argues that because everything is physical, and in a world where everything is material, there is no decent explanation for the concept of a thought. For certainly a thought is not material. Rosenberg decides to actually just destroy that whole process known as thought. He argues that when we believe we are processing a thought, when I believe that I'm thinking about Paris or about Mecca or about Karbala, I'm not really doing such but rather what is being projected onto me is an illusion. He gives the example of a movie and states that it is like a show reel or a reel of film which has been filmed of actors performing certain scenes that a thought is like a movie being played in my head. It's a series of still images being played in the right direction. Now, of course, this is Rosenberg's ideal of a thought. And so he argues that thinking about anything is an overwhelmingly powerful illusion. To quote his exact words, when dealing with the possible objection that reality, if Rosenberg doesn't believe in such a thing as thought, then what is going on when we read such a book as Rosenberg's? Are we engaging a, in a thought process whilst reading his book? he states the following on page 193. This book isn't conveying statements. It's rearranging neural circuits, removing inaccurate disinformation and replacing it with accurate information. Treat it as correcting maps instead of erasing sentences. So Rosenberg's new revisionist view of the very thought process of human beings has disastrous consequences in regards to the act of thinking, writing, reading, speaking, interpreting, reasoning, and any other activities which involve the concept of intentionality or aboutness. But the problem with this is if we as human beings all perceive a reality which is external to us, if we were to discuss the concept of aboutness as human beings together collectively as people of intellect, we would see that everyone assumes that there is aboutness about our lives. We assume that when we have a thought about something, we genuinely had that thought. That's why when we watch these political debates, these social commentaries on, on these public forums that you would see on channels like the BBC, you might see them on American TV channels. I'm not up to date with modern day American TV, but I remember as a very young child, we used to see a show called The Donahue Show. I'm not sure if it still airs in America or if I'm just talking about something which has completely been forgotten by the modern audience of this channel. But on these shows, what you would see is highly controversial figures of dare I say, highly socially, socially questionable viewpoints, be they white nationalists, 
Afrocentric revivalists, or indeed other people who, have, who hold views known to be fringe and also socially distasteful, to say the very least, they would be brought onto these shows, and on these shows they would discuss these issues as a group. Often they would be provoked into saying something very provocative, and the audience would gasp, and in shock and horror, they would try to reason with such an individual, and they would hold such a person accountable not merely for taking certain actions, but also just for holding certain thoughts. For a lot of people today, we hold them accountable for the thoughts that they hold as opposed to the actions that they do. If what Rosenberg is teaching us is actually correct, then essentially we live in such a disastrous world that such things where we once held people responsible for what they believed, and we once found it grotesquely immoral that someone could be a racist, someone could be a, a chauvinist who opposes women and everything, someone could be a many more other disgusting types of crimes which people commit in their minds. And yet we would not be able to blame them for the very actions and beliefs that they take. Because we would say, oh, you see, it's not really his fault. He doesn't have a choice in it because you see, there's no such thing as thought. Now, of course, I know that in the criminal justice system, there are those who believe that this is a legitimate argument. In future episodes where we discuss the moral arguments, I will cite to you certain advisors who have written to the very judges of the legal systems, and particularly in the case study I'm thinking of, it was in America, where they tried to argue that, look, we need to start showing more leniency towards the criminal when we put them on trial. We can't judge them with the harsh standards that we once used to. But the problem with such a series of thoughts is, if you're writing to the judge saying that the criminal did not have any choice in determining the action they would do, because you see, people don't have a choice whatsoever, and in reality, they were forced to by the series of physical events which occurred prior to that in a domino, so in a domino rally sort of effect, then what you're essentially assuming is you're assuming that the judge is free from that process where there's not a domino rally effect causing her judgments as well. And more importantly, you as the independent researcher are also assuming that there's no domino effect causing a bias in your judgments as a researcher too. You see, what this does is it makes rationality impossible. And anyone that wants to cut out rationality, be they the modern day, new age, materialist, physicalist, atheist, or be they the Salafi, who argues that we suspend rationality entirely when it comes to their demi-urge type demigod equivalent of a deity, we would understand that this is impossible because what are we doing here? We're coming to the table to reason. Now, dear viewers, thank you for bearing patiently with me. I just ask you to bear quickly with me for a few seconds. We're going to go for a quick break. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Of course, Rosenberg, the very professor who came up with this series of thoughts, he himself admits that this is extremely depressing and it's something which, of course, is something that no many people will be depressed by. He argues that this reality, whilst being breathtaking, whilst being liberating, is indeed depressing. And we can see why. Is it livable? Can someone really live this way? Can you live this way assuming that you don't make any choices in life? That essentially everything is being driven by a pre-existing physical event, but there's no such thing as morality. That emotions such as love are merely reactions in the body no different from 
the digestive system. Is this really how we think about the meaningful things in life? According to Rosenberg, the only good reason to be good in life is because it makes you feel better. But Rosenberg has a solution for those who do find it a bit too depressing. And that solution for Rosenberg is that we should take Prozac and other types of drugs until our brain chemistry realigns and helps us appreciate and understand this reality that is the reality of the atheist worldview. I mentioned in yesterday's closing, but the rest of us, we would look at these things and we would say, look, okay, we understand it. According to our understanding of a physical world, if physicality and the physical facts were the only facts determining reality, we would say yes. If there is no God, then there is neither morality. There is neither a thought process. There is no such thing as intentionality. There is no such thing as higher realities and higher emotions such as love. There is no meaning to anything. But, on the other hand, clearly we do perceive meaning. Clearly we do all agree that there is morality. And clearly we can trust our thought process because indeed our thought process has gotten us very far as human beings. That's the train of thought the rest of us would have. And what we would conclude from that is, therefore there's a God. Unfortunately, these people, they start off with a worldview and the lenses that there's no God, therefore I will deny everything, including my very ability to reason. And it's a bit like, of course, as I mentioned previously, it's a bit like the, the believer from the denomination of the Salafis, who will suspend his reason because he wants to accept the doctrines that have been down, handed down to him from the Salaf al-Salah. So it's two claims to authority, both of them blocking the very existence and leeway of the intellect. Why? In one case, we would say, science, the very enterprise which I must use my intellect for, if we conclude only the physical facts, states, and has no accountability, has no way of accounting for or sorry, explanatory power for the concept of human thought. Therefore, instead of appealing to something other than science, I'll go with what science says and I'll come up with a purely scientific explanation, even if it means I deny human thought the very thing I had to do to even think of what science's explanation is. Likewise, you have another group of people, in this case people that claim to follow the original Islam, who would say that, look, my intellect might tell me something, my intellect might reason in X way, however, the Salaf as Saleh, who are always right, have told me otherwise, therefore let's throw my intellect to the side, let's roll with the Salaf as Saleh. Now, these two kinds of thought processes aren't very healthy. And what we see with the first atheist process, which is that the more they uncover everything, the more arguments for why a God is absolutely necessary for everything in existence we find. They want to close the doors on the existence of God, so what will they do? They will deny reality in its entirety. They will deny everything we know about ourselves. And it really reminds me of the saying of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who states, Man, who states, A'arafakum bi rabbihi, A'arafakum bi nafsihi, A'arafakum bi rabbihi, sorry. Whoever knows himself best would know his Lord best. Which is of course in line with a famous expression attributed to Amir al-Mu'mineen, Man arafa nafsuhu faqad arafa rabbahu. Whoever knows himself knows his Lord. Why? Because the more we uncover about ourselves, the more we realize how dependent we are, and indeed we are in need of someone who has the ability to sustain all of us and to explain all of this. All these shortcomings we have are explained away by the Ahlul Bayt. And that's why this argument, this argument about the very ability to reason is crucial. It's not that reason points back to God. It's that without God, without Allah Azawajal, the very concept of reasoning would be absurd and is indeed absurd. Now, of course, 
Is it merely Alex Rosenberg who's come up with these particular views? Of course not. I've cited these statements before. I'm going to cite them again just for the benefits of the viewers so they understand I'm not strawmanning, I'm not misrepresenting or misportraying or characterizing my opponent's argument in a way which is invalid or inaccurate. This is the way of thought which was indeed realized and understood by many a great atheist thinker and indeed was the reason that brought some of these atheists back out of the darkness of denying God's existence and into the realm of accepting a God. Charles Darwin states, the founder of a theory of evolution as it existed in the late 19th century. He states what? With me the horrid doubt always arises whether the convictions of man's mind which has been developed from the mind of the lower animals are of any value at all or of any value or at all trustworthy. Would anyone trust in the convictions of a monkey's mind if there are any convictions in such a mind? Very good question. If I'm no different as a human being from those that evolved into monkeys, what differentiates me in why I would be able to trust my reasoning prowess and ability if I don't trust that a monkey does particularly well at philosophical reasoning, why would I trust a human being does? Philosopher Patricia Churchland, who likewise is an atheist, states the following thing. Boiled down to essentials, a nervous system, that is to say the system of a human being which copes with our survival, enables the organism to succeed in the four Fs. Feeding, fleeing, fighting, and reproducing. Now, of course, those who don't get why the last F is an R, this is the method of the writer. I have nothing to do with this. It's not my joke. It's not my bad joke. And it's not my inappropriate, distasteful joke. The principal chore of nervous systems is to get the body parts where they should be in order that the organism may survive. Improvements in sensory motor control confer an evolutionary advantage. A fancier style of representing is advantageous so long as it is geared to the organism's way of life and enhances the organism's chances of survival. Truth whatever that is, definitely takes the hindmost. Now, dear viewers, we've successfully summarized, inshallah ta'ala, what the absurd denial of God, the denial of Allah Azawajal's existence, does to our understanding and our perception of reality. This is not my words. These are not things that I have stated are a natural consequence. These are words taken from those who are proud proponents and defenders and people who wish to propagate the message and worldview of atheism. Now, of course, if we want to go with that route, we can deny everything. And of course, again, it's like shooting yourself in the head. It's really playing Russian roulette with all six bullets loaded. It's a bit like Salafi theology. But for those of us who want to take our religion and our life and our experience seriously, there is another option. And that option is, of course, I confer to you the existence of a creator who has made everything in perfect harmony and balance, and that is Allah Azza wa Jal. Dear viewers, thank you once more for joining me, and we'll continue tomorrow with our analysis of the Imam's narrations on the Aql. Thank you so much. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ooh. Mm -hmm.